We continue with physical principles of wave energy. When you design a wave energy converter, you need to estimate not only wave pressure, wave energy and wave power, but also wave-induced forces acting on a structure. And the key topic of today's lecture is wave forces on structures Morrison's equation. So how can we estimate wave-induced forces on structures? The approach you take depends on the relative size of the structure that can be defined by the ratio of representative size of the structure to the wavelengths. So d divided by lambda, where d is representative size of the structure, for example, diameter, and lambda is the wavelengths. Depending on this ratio, there are three different types of structures. Small structures, defined when this ratio is less than 0.2, and for small structures, viscosity and separation effects determine loading on the structure. The structure only affects the wave field, which is in the immediate vicinity. And to calculate forces, we use Morrison's equation. For example, it could be offshore wind turbines or riser systems or fixed jacket structures. There are also large structures, and large structures are defined when the ratio of representative size two wavelengths is between 0.2 and 1. And for this type of structures, we have waves that are diffracted or scattered by the structure, and diffraction analysis based on potential flow is used to determine forces, and for example, wave forces on very large concrete gravity platforms. These are fall within these large structures. And another type of structures is Reflecting structure. And reflecting structures are defined when the ratio of d divided by lambda is greater than 1. An example of such structures include seawalls. In this lecture, we focus on wave induced forces acting on small structures that are defined when the ratio of representative size of the structure divided by wavelengths is less than 0.2 because this is applicable for wave energy devices. And in this case, we will use Morrison's equation. According to Morrison's equation, the total wave-induced force acting on a small structure is equal to the drag force plus inertia force. This equation was proposed by Morrison and his co-authors in 1950. And you can find this article using the reference provided on this slide. In this equation, drag force includes product of velocity multiplied by absolute value of velocity. And this is because we would like to get direction as well. F here is the total instantaneous force. So it takes into account the magnitude and direction. And this is changing during the passage of the wave. V is instantaneous velocity of the water particle, and generally we take components of instantaneous velocities, because we know velocity is a vector. And in this case, we take horizontal velocity component U and vertical component W. AP is representative projected area, and V with index wall is the volume of the structure and V with dot on top is the instantaneous water particle acceleration, which is defined as the rate of change of velocity in time. And again, we usually take two components, horizontal component, which is U dot DU DT, and vertical component, which is W dot DW DT. To determine the total wave-induced force acting on a small structure, we need to estimate the drag force and inertia force. From this equation, we can see that the drag force depends on the velocity in power 2, so we need to determine velocity, and also depends on drag coefficient, so we need to determine drag coefficient. 
Inertia force is proportional to velocity acceleration, V dot or dV dt, but also depends on inertia coefficient Cm. And inertia coefficient depends on the edit mass coefficient, that is the measure of volume of surrounding fluid that is accelerated. Both coefficients, drag and inertia coefficients, depend on Reynolds number and also on dimensionless number that is called Culligan Carpenter number and roughness. And this dimensionless number, Culligan Carpenter number, is defined as the ratio of the product of maximum amplitude of horizontal velocity, U max, multiplied by wave period and divided by structure diameter, D. And this dimensionless number, Culligan Carpenter number, is a dimensionless quality that describes the relative importance of drag forces over inertia forces for bluff objects in a solitary fluid flow. There are different diagrams that an engineer can use to determine drag and inertia coefficients. For example, on this slide, I show you a diagram that you can use to determine drag coefficient for horizontal cylinders. On this diagram, you can see that the drag coefficient depends on Culligan Carpenter number, but also depends on Reynolds number because different lines represent different values of Reynolds number, but also depends on roughness, because different lines represent different roughness. This is an example of a diagram that can be used to determine inertia coefficient. From this diagram, you can see that inertia coefficient depends on Culligan Carpenter number, and also Reynolds number, because different lines represent different values of Reynolds number, and also roughness. So depending on your design and on your site, you would choose inertia coefficient applicable for your design. So to be able to calculate the total instantaneous force acting on a structure, we would need to estimate also instantaneous water particle velocities and accelerations. Because you not only need drag coefficient and inertia coefficient, you also need instantaneous water particle velocities and also instantaneous accelerations. Because in this equation, F is the total instantaneous wave-induced force, V is instantaneous water particle velocity, and V dot is instantaneous water particle acceleration. And you would need to estimate this to obtain instantaneous total force. And for this, we would need equations for the kinematics of wave particles. Under the wave surface, the water particles undergo movements. So how can we estimate instantaneous water particle velocities and accelerations? We can use equations for the kinematics of water particles, as shown on this slide. So here I show you how we can estimate horizontal velocity, horizontal acceleration, vertical velocity, and vertical acceleration. And depending on your wave conditions, if it's intermediate wave, deep wave, or shallow wave, we have a set of equations that we can use to determine instantaneous water particle accelerations and velocities using these equations. I don't show you derivations of these equations, but please know these equations, they follow from linear wave theory and also velocity potential function. Derivation is reasonably complex, therefore I just summarized all the equations in this table. And depending on your conditions, you use equations that are applicable for your design.